Thank you, Bronwyn. Thank you very much for this very uh, uh, moving and uh, heartfelt introduction. Uh, when I came here, I thought that I had a number of uh, the usual uh, funny stories that one makes or tells to break the ice or to make oneself a lot more at ease. And I've forgotten them all. <laughs> I would like to say that I greet uh, all the people that are responsible for this August occasion. And uh, the honors have been made already, and I align myself with that. I cannot sufficiently express the honor bestowed by the invitation to deliver this year's Nadin Godima Memorial Lecture. It's a privilege to share with you some of my thoughts and insights about someone whose creativity has been universally lauded and rewarded with prestigious accolades, accolades that found expression in countless literary prizes exemplified by both the Booker and the Nobel Prizes. The title of my talk is The Vocabulary of Witnesses. It could be received as an appeal for all of us in this country to play our part as witnesses, witnesses who are also activists and truth tellers. Because as you have seen countless times, there are cases of other types of witnesses, those who bear false witness. This call is even more vital for the young people who join us here or are participating on the virtual platform. Each time I make a speech and locate myself within any address to an audience, I rely on poetry as a prism through which to see life. In this instance, the life of a writer who, despite being described as petite, bread-like and soft-spoken, was a dynamic presence and stood head and shoulders above her peers. In this, Nadine Godima reminds me of another writer, our late poet laureate, Yurapetsi Willi Hositsile, who, whilst also small in stature, gave meaning to the Isizulu saying, Aithabi Ngagumisa. This simply means that the dimensions of a bull's horns do not necessarily determine its capacity to fight or its appetite for battle. To frame my reflections today, I will draw a few lines from the poetic work of Margaret Walker, For My People. For my people, standing, staring, trying to fashion a better way from confusion, from hypocrisy and misunderstanding, trying to fashion a world that will hold all the people, all the Adams and Eves and their countless generations. These four important lines are majorly directed to the young people of this land and lands beyond the countless generations who in their own way contribute towards giving us a reality check. If you had told me when I was a youth 
growing up in the township of Kwamashu, 20 kilometers north of Durban. If you had even suggested that today I'd be giving a memorial lecture on Nadine Godima, I would have told you that that would not be. As a young man then imbued with revolutionary zeal, and perhaps as a consequence of my early encounters with the white gaze, I was convinced that white people were incapable of introspection. For them, I believed there wasn't that possibility of doing what James Baldwin calls wrestling with the conscience in the snarling loneliness of the midnight hour. In my early recollections of the white gaze, there were white people like Reverend John, John Stade, who was my father's superior in the church. When we lived in Mayville, he used to arrive in a black Studebaker and unload boxes full of cast of clothes and toys. The toys consisted of plastic gym crack cars and rifles that simply broke into pieces in our hands. They were obsolete long before the box was emptied. My elder sister received dolls with plastic blonde hair and blue eyes and fluttering eyelashes. Relishing the power position he occupied in the holy hierarchy, Reverend John Stead treated our parents with a benign condescension bordering on contempt. I think I resented him, perhaps with the same deathless bitterness we reserved for the apartheid municipality police. But unacceptable as his condescension was, Reverend State became my entry point into poetry. This was not the prescribed textbook poetry of daffodils or how much do I love thee? Rather, this was the poetry which the Polish, Polish poet Adam Zagajewski calls a kind of secret power and a repository of lucidity where you understand better. Poetry that meant finding ways of seeing beyond what was on the surface, to be alert to, be alert to the truth engraved on the substrate of life. In my father's house, I reached the conclusion that our voices could not reach the ear of God, the God before whom we all bent our knees in praise. My mother's diligent patching of the knees of our pens until patching proved impossible was all in vain. The upside of grinding poverty and a lack of sporting amenities meant dividing time between playing on the streets, on the dusty streets, and reading. Reverend State brought books, boxes of books, which some patrons had donated for the quote unquote children of South Africa. These included any Brighton's Nordi series, where I encountered Nordi big ears and goalie work. There were religious tracts, musty, gilt edged volumes of the Reader's Digest, comics like The Beano, Mickey Mouse, and Spy the Dean, classics like Ben Ur, The Hounds of the Baskervilles, and miscellaneous fiction and nonfiction books. Since they've been sent by trustworthy church organizations, they have been given the green light by the paid voyeurs in state employ, the censors. I remember a surprise find, Judas, my brother, by Frank Yabi, and was even more astonished when my brother Ben told me that the author was black. Reading begets reading. 
cognizant of the fact that we were living in the long hour of discontent when the Bando Education Act was passed in 1953 and when black teachers, other professionals and artists who had read the writing on the wall were fleeing the country in droves, we determined to seek more texts that would counter the poison that was being introduced into our education. There was a time in the mid 1950s when we started to hear rumblings about Congress. Soon these rumblings translated into activity on our streets where people marched and at night they were burning buildings. I remember as a boy the introduction of the Isizulu program on the radio, which at the time we called the wireless. Because the program started at 9.30 and ended at 10, our chimney sweeper, a mysterious man called Mjanti Katobela, made us believe that black people were actually created by God exactly at 9.30 in the morning. I remember the beer hall in case of men are burning after the women led by Dorothy Nyembe chased the men out of, the, out of it on the understanding that the sorghum beer was the state's ploy to render the men weak and unproductive. In our quest to counter the effects of Bandu education, we turned to bookstores like Adams and Greeks, the Lutheran bookstore and the Methodist bookstore in the city. Bearing in mind that we didn't have any money, when procuring these books in religious stores through a process we called repossession, we hope that the good Lord would forgive us for our unconventional methods. We went to the second-hand bookstores. Since there were no welcoming libraries, we found Solis browsing in the Ajmeri Arcade second-hand bookstore. Here we refrained from repossession. We read what we could find. On days when we had a little cash, we picked up dog-eared copies of what had eluded the eye of the censor and augmented our township stock for our reading circle. I encountered Nadine Godema's writing via the Heinemann African Writer Series where she was curiously in the company of Chinua Achebe, Guki Wationgo, Puchi Emecheta, Mariema Ba, Mbela Sone Tipoko, names that had a certain magical resonance about them in that they came from an unknown Africa where people lived lives according to the rhythm of their soul. More than that, it was an Africa that struck terror into the hearts of the rulers of the land, whose reign of terror was our lived experience. We, deploy, we deployed a simple way of, of evaluating the suitability or otherwise of a writer. We reasoned that if Nadine Godima spoke of short stories, some money for sure, Wraps shoulders with works of such luminaries as Leopold Sedar Senghor or Mongo Beatty, then this white lady was all right. He took a reading of Nadine's essay, A South African Childhood, to disabuse me of the romanticized notion of Africa. She wrote, quote, I suppose it is a pity that as children, we did not know what people like to talk of as the real Africa, the Africa of proud black warriors and great jungle rivers and enormous silent nights. That anachronism of a country belonging to its own birds and beef and beasts and savages, which rouses such nostalgia in the citified neighbor jostle heart and out of which mystique, a mystique has been created by writers and film directors, unquote. 
One of the factors that endeared Nadine Gorima to me, which made me identify with her, was the knowledge that, cognizant of the fact that she had little formal education, she schooled herself by studying the masters of European fiction. She modeled herself on and studied the works of Proust, Chekhov, and Dostoevsky. She read voraciously Russian literature, broadening her understanding not only of the white world, but of the world at large. This included reading on anti-colonial, pan-African, and Caribbean cultural political movements such as Negritude, which was led by luminaries, by a gallery of scholars, writers, artists, and activists such as Aim Césaire, Leopold Senghor, Leon Damas, and Franz Fanon, and many others. She briefly attended the University of Vietnam, where she made the acquaintance of educated young Black Africans for the first time. She came to know many of the young Black writers and artists who gathered in Sophia Town. In all this, you get a sense of Nadine as someone who not only was an observer of Africa, but also someone molded and shaped by and in love with Africa. She always spoke of her responsibility as a human being, as a, a white African. To be part of this world, she told Charlene Hunter Gold, in an 1987 interview, you've got to put your life on the line, where she advocates taking sides in the struggle. She plays great stock on being on the right side of history. A misreading of history has led to enduring tragedies on our continent. Some can be put on the doorstep of certain leaders whose cavalier attitude to the plight of the men and women on the street has led to ruin, death, and a disregard for human life. Some of the tragedies have been unavoidable, such as natural causes. However, history is eloquent in cases where exemplary leaders try their best. In a book, White Malice, subtitled The CIA and the Neocolonization of Africa, Susan Williams catalogues the covert operations mounted by the CIA to undermine any African effort towards creating effective democratic states or dispensations for their populations. Closer to our shores, Nelson Mandela's arrest and incarceration could be credited to the surveillance carried out by the CIA. There was Lumumba, the creation of puppets like Mobutu and Savimbi, and our own homegrown grizzlings that have held our country in thrall. The characters or a composite thereof appear in Nadine's work. They are not caricatures of venal, hypersex, and blood and bloodthirsty individuals that titillate the Western imagery, but well-rounded figures, people with an interiority and agency. This helps us understand them and their weaknesses, even if at times they repulse us. I believe the work of a witness driven by a need to adhere to the truth requires an honest portrayal of people in all their different situations. In her essay on growth and development as a writer in mid 20th century South Africa, quote, growing, called, uh, the book is called, the essay is Growing Up, which was first published in the London Magazine in May 1963. She writes about her awakening as a writer the rise of creative consciousness, which includes the false starts 
sidestepping unreliable advice and luck. Luck which was aided by a single-mindedness rare for one that young. Quote, in a humbling way that sometimes slid home in an unexpected strike, I was looking for what people meant but didn't say, not only about sex, but also about politics and their relationship with the black people among whom we lived as people live in a forest among trees. So it was that I didn't wake up to Africans and the shameful enormity of the color bar through a youthful spell in the Communist Party, as did some of my contemporaries with whom I shared the rejection of white supremacy, but through the apparently esoteric speleology of doubt led by Kafka rather than Marx, close quote. In essays and in fiction, Nadine put these complexities in the public domain. Writing in the New York Times, the beleaguered uh, Salman Rushdie reviews a short story at the rendezvous of victory, which he calls a classic cameo portrait of the guerrilla general for whom, after the success of the revolution, his old friend, now prime minister, of the newly liberated nation has less and less time. This portrait of a discarded hero has many parallels with countless betrayals currently happening in most parts of the continent and even within our borders. Much more importantly, however, the story which is allegorical of the disasters that have befallen post-colonial or post-liberation Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, the so-called third world, they could have come from the pens of Chinua Achebe or Aikwe Yarma, whose resonances, with resonances of both, the beautiful ones are not yet born, and the end hills of the savannah. Here, previously celebrated freedom fighters like Ahmed Ben Bella in Algeria, the Mau Mau in Kenya, Josiah Tongagara in Zimbabwe, just to name a few, who refrained from towing the line become a national embarrassment when erstwhile enemies kiss and make up at the rendezvous between former colonizer and former colonized. Although scathing, Nadine's tone is limbed with the tenderness of an activist admonishing a cherished though flawed compatriot. It's probably in recognition of Nadine's principle support for the struggle against apartheid, her unflinching criticism of errant struggle leaders notwithstanding, which endeared her to Nelson Mandela. In the unread and unsent letter to Nadine Godema, by an American writer, Professor Thomas Cleave, who laments a world without her. It is a world that, quote, did seem a bit safer with people like you in it, just as it did when Mr. Mandela was in it, remembering that you were one of the very first people he wanted to visit upon his release from prison. And Mr. Baldwin was in it, and Ms. Audrey Lord was in it. People, like a certain number of others, but not so many others, in fact, very few on this planet who constantly and fearlessly spoke the truth. Even though she could have passed in the glory of association with leaders, like Nelson Mandela, Nadine Godema was wary of power other than the creative power of artists and writers. During the years of struggle, she immersed herself in the work of political literary organizations, being a founder member and patron 
of the Congress of South African Writers Corso for several years, as well as a frequent speaker at gatherings of the United Democratic Front. This was the time when her role as witness was at its strongest, at a time when being part of the struggle was costly in terms of personal safety and reputation. She supported the African National Congress at a period when the support was dangerous. She wouldn't, however, go into exile. And I, for one, am happy that she didn't. I suspect that exile would have blunted their sharpness, as it did many creative people, and would have possibly mired her in sideshows that would have served her creativity. Possibly as an echo, in an echo of one of Edward Said's modern dictums, where he called exile one of the saddest fates. Given the history of this country with its hideous past, a past that still flexes its muscle in the present, its racial nightmare, a question can arise. Why celebrate a white writer? What is so special about Nadine Gorima? The question of race, a social construct, is something that flavors our dinner time conversations and sometimes causes speech to stutter and becomes the elephant in the room. It has been exploited by shrewd and unprincipled politicians of every stripe. The logic behind the question is that Nadine's route to literary success was preordained by her birth and social standing which warranted access to the best research facilities, et cetera. But whiteness alone does not necessarily endow a person with a magic wand, which suddenly gives the owner with wisdom and talent. Like muscles that have to be trained, these qualities must be worked for it. For if the person black or white will, excuse me, must be worked for the person black or white to become a writer of integrity. And these writers might not necessarily become successful writers or household names. That also hinges on the lottery of life, on the appetites of readers and vagaries of the literary market. As writers, we come to understand there is no clear science about what gets published, what gets printed, awarded, or gets to bookshelves. Our prime concern must be the dedication to our creative craft. Nadine possessed this tireless commitment. In addition, there is a quality of integrity of empathy that one as a writer makes a conscious choice about in their writing or in the production of any creative work. Nadine possessed this awareness, this integrity, this empathy. I remember during one of the literary festivals, I think it was one of the Sunday Times Awards that were being chaired, that was chaired at the time by Perry Ronge. And I was with Nuruddin Farah and Nadine walked in holding onto the hand of journalist Maureen Isaacson with the poet Mongani Wali Serote in lockstep. At a table during one of the breaks that evening, we spoke of the time I attended the London premiere of Cry Freedom at the glittery Leicester Square Empire in November 1987. My only claim to fame for the event was that earlier in 1985 or so, during the planning of the film, I was part of the team led by Tabombegi, which hosted film director Sir Richard Attenborough, 
casting director Susie Figgis, Dali Tambo, and a few technical people, when they paid a courtesy call to the ANC president, Oliver Tambo in Busaga. The London team sought to cast some of the members of the exile community for the film, searching as it were for a person who could play the part of Steve Beagle. They realized that people might be guerrillas, might be activists, but acting is another story altogether. But they drew a blank. We then met daily for two weeks at the Plush Pamoti Hotel to advise on the script, which was written by John Briley. And Briley is still basking in the success of Oscar winning Gandhi and working on a biopic on Martin Luther King. He sought to cast Steve Vigo as a pacifist. It was something that we could not abide. We made our input uh, to Sir Richard in the full knowledge that you can't win against the Hollywood empire. The exigencies of the box office, we were informed, dictated that the film be about Donald Woods as played by Kevin Klein, and that Steve Vigo, notwithstanding his stature in the politics of South Africa, could only be a pivotal character who would be interpreted by Denzel Washington. Watching the film with due respect to the director's noble intention and Mr. Klein's representation, it was Denzel Washington who carried the film, where he tapped into the history of his own ancestors to channel Vigo's spirit, to be less an interpreter than a a vessel play, paying homage. There's a scene in the film where Donald Wood's character, together with his family, effects his escape from South Africa, unbeknownst to the, to the maid, who was played evocatively uh, by Sophie Mdrina. And the maid was left in, char in charge of the family dog. At the end of the film, uh, Kevin Klein crosses into Lesotho, crosses the river, and does a very inspired jig. Uh, and then after the movie, as usually happens, there are drinks, there are canapes outside on the foyer. And as we were standing there, I saw a group of uh, British uh, matrons, very respectable people, who were grouped around one woman who was obviously very distressed. And uh, I overheard her say, oh my God, I don't know what, whatever happened to that dog. I remember Nadine's reaction, her words, to the fact that even though the movie patron had been invited to the premiere for her support for the anti-apartheid movement, she still lacked empathy for the other human being, the maid, would be distraught once the implications of her erstwhile employer's flight sank in. Moreover, and I hadn't thought of this angle but this is something born of Nadine's knowledge of the workings of, of the South African Gestapo. She suggested that the maid would suffer in the hands of the special branch because they would come to her and say, Vaz your bus. Edith Stein, famously known primarily for her philosophical work on empathy and affectivity, contains the empathy that empathy is the consequence, is experience of foreign consciousness in general. In my understanding, this meant empathy can only arise out of one's gradual perception of the reality of others. 
knowledge like paint affecting the qualities of the canvas suffuses the consciousness, leading to a clarity of sorts about, to borrow a trite phrase, how the other half lives. I found examples of this empathy in one of Nadine's earlier short stories, whose title is a favored biblical lamentation, Ah, Woe is Me. It's from an anthology titled Short Stories by South African Writers. Some of the writers in the anthology are Sarah Gertrude Mifflin, Francis Kerry Slater, and Ace Grich. In Our Woe is Me, the unnamed narrator, a middle-aged white woman, seemingly well off, if only in the eyes of her dependents, is caught between being sympathetic towards the plight of her erstwhile helper, together with her children, victims of state-sponsored impoverishment under apartheid and the conventional way of doing things, which meant doing nothing dictated by her affiliation to the fellowship of whiteness. This state of in-betweenness is a source of unstated though implied unease, complete with the fortunate woman, conjuring a happier dispensation for the unfortunate while knowing deep down in her heart that this couldn't be achieved. Nadine was well-versed in communicating, communicating the importance of the powerful, much more in her early life in the mining towns with their habitual harshness that characterizes all frontier societies. She had seen, she had seen even though sometimes she wasn't aware of how much of what she witnessed had lodged in her mind, like a weaver's nest on the branches of, a, of vulnerable trees. Because in this story, what stands out is an awareness of the precarity, especially of young women, whose bodies, to quote a line from one of Rebecca Solnit's essays, grows, healing, making, transforming, and laboring below the threshold of consciousness. With all this, Nadine's empathy shown shines through. In this past sage, the nameless Madame meets the helper's children and asks after the mother, offering her via her children a chance for a casual job. Quote, no, she couldn't take the washing anymore. Yes, they were still at school. I always had the curious feeling that they were embarrassed not by me, but for me. As if their faces knew that I could not help asking these same questions because the real state of their lives was unknown and unimagined by me and therefore beyond my questioning." Unquote. The key to empathy lies in the, our admission that we are ignorant of the inner lives of others. Nadine's own rise of consciousness was steeped in her association with and, and familiarity with both black and white, with both writers, black write, writing and writers, sorry, which became an intellectual crucible for her own work. She writes of following the output of writers like Eski Ampachel, Louis Ngozi Kentemba, Blok Modisane, the so-called drum generation of writers, and Peter Abrahams. There were those who, unashamed, who were unashamedly political like Alex Laguma and Dennis Brutus, who in her own words, quote, made of their ideologically channeled bitterness not more than the Aristotelian catharsis, creating in the reader empathy with the oppressed rather than browsing rebellion against repression, unquote. In the passage from the story, Woe is Me, 
the perplexed madame could not help asking these same questions because the real state of their lives was unknown and unimagined by me. In the realm where the imagined and the real converge, where the dream, dreamt up characters come face to face with oneself, the writer has a choice whether to unearth the troublesome character or bury him or her in the underground of the South African conscience. In this regard, at the risk of being excommunicated from the tribe, Nadine was one of the few writers who captured with astounding clarity and economy of words the dilemma which others call the liberal quandary facing white South Africans and apartheid. In my high school years in 1969-70, as if to make Nadine's words real, a situation that spoke to the tension between the mythicized Africa in the imagination of fabulous and, and, and the Africa of more than a billion inhabitants in 54 countries, we were invited to a screening of Watusi a sequel to King Solomon Mines, based on novels by Sir Ryder Haggard. It was a harrowing experience where we watched a modern day Tarzan, slugging it out with scantily dressed, bug eyed crazed African marauders, who for some inexplicable reason, seemed intent on seizing a scantily dressed blue eyed blonde, whose range of facial expressions was be between a pout and a horrified scream. I remember my father's admonition that sometimes things will anger you, but you must maintain composure. But I couldn't remain calm. What was even more galling was the role of the chiefs who were helping the soldiers in colonial uniforms to protect the woman's virtue while decimating the crazed hordes. I got some of my schoolmates to disrupt the film session and we marched out of the, to the alarm of the, and the consternation of the school principal. I'm sure that if Nadine had seen this film, she would have been as equally horrified and chastened by the bankruptcy of the imagination that had produced it should have seen it as a kindling that had led the country ablaze in the mid 1970s and in cultural and its cultural concomitant in the poetry and writing that bloomed like mushrooms after an electric storm. She has written about black writing, positioning it as a testimony of witnesses. There have been debates from which she has not flinched whether black people could write about white characters or lives and vice versa, and posits the view that the very fact that we share this bleeding piece of ground means we're all locked in an embrace where willy nilly were fated to know more about one another than we care to admit. She carefully avoided the role of spokesperson, even though her celebrity put her in the front line of circumstances over which she had little control. There would be events that dictated that she takes a stand, such as the occasion of the weekly male literary festival that sought to invite Salman Rushdie, who had just had a fatwa imposed on him by the Ayatollah in Iran. This led to the disinvitation of Rashti by the Congress of South African Writers, of which Nadine was a member. This led to the much publicized difference of opinion between Nadine and J.M. Kutsia, who felt that the Writers Conference had knuckled under the influence and threats of fundamentalists. Nadine voiced her concern over the safety of conference attendees. She bristled at the notion that she had capitulated to forces that were 
against freedom of speech. So many years later, I, I have my own take on why Nadine agreed with the decision that, co that caution be practiced. She was a very methodical and unflappable person and would have been convinced that given the threats of bombs and mayhem, she couldn't in good conscience allow the spilling of blood if she could avoid it. I think she was also incensed by the fact that the proponents of inviting Rushdie and consequences be damned were voicing this bravado from relative safety. They wouldn't, to quote Malcolm X, be the ones catching hell. The Rushdie affair, it must be remembered, is one issue that has seriously divided societies, thinkers, proponents, and adversaries on the spectrum of the inviolability of free speech. If memory serves me well, the conference took place before the truly ghastly adventures by Rushdie's enemies, before the killings of editors, much earlier before the Charlie Hebdo killings in France. I'm not sure what would have been the position of the lobby that felt that the Rushdie should have been invited had they been given a crystal ball and a peak in our world's horrifying future. I also don't know what would have happened, what would have been the stance of the group like Nadine, which took the conservative view that his invitation would usher in problems. Perhaps in recognition of the unfinished and unfinishable nature of debates that involve politics, religion, and passions. Nadine wrote a thoughtful, if somewhat indignant, article on censorship, titled Censorship, The Final Solution. This phrase she must have known sends chills down anyone's spine with its association with Nazi euphemisms for the Holocaust. It underscores her disgust. She traverses the terrain from ancient times to the contemporary world where writers were persecuted and cites Victor Hugo, Flaubert, D.H. Lawrence, Dostoevsky, and many others. The many others, of course, would include Grugi and Wale Shoying. The International Writers' Organization, PEN, or Index on Censorship, or even when not grinding a political ex, Amnesty International, always sound the alarm about injustice befalling a writer, a journalist in some corner of the globe. It was Cheslo Milos who asked, what is poetry which does not save nations or peoples? The role of the writer in a state of conflict has to be separated from the role of, the, of a combatant. In rare situations, these two roles become blurred, sometimes with tragic results. Nadine was very aware of her role and of her limitation. In an interview on the role of the writer in a political world, she said, quote, I think that a writer can raise the consciousness of people in situations of conflict and turmoil. Their work can also have an effect on the outside world. It can provide an understanding of the people involved in the conflict. In that sense, it has a far greater impact than journalism. From the outside, it is difficult to be aware of the sensitive areas in a country such as ours, the areas where clashes really take place. What seems daring outside the country may not be crucial inside. Writing about black and white love affairs, for instance, is not dangerous because it doesn't challenge the power structure and won't change anything. Whereas a story about saboteurs, like the novella, something out there, may put writers in a place where they are seen as supporting terrorists, 
or portraying them as human beings. Terrorism is real. Sometimes that happens all the time. Portraying these people as humans is a more delicate and dangerous matter, unquote. Today, we need writers and commentators with, with the sensitivity, courage, and professionalism evinced by Nadine Godima. Throughout time, she became almost synonymous with a certain type of writing that was marked by one characteristic. It made the then apartheid authorities nervous. From where we were, those of us straddling the two worlds of political engagement and cultural work, which sometimes morphed into one and the same thing, Nadine Godima became an instant prized possession in our treasury, a sister from another mother, a dependable ally, a sense of empathy with the struggling people of the world, made her a rare figure in an even in an area where in individualism and personal glory were the first prize. Her scholarship and erudition led her towards exploring the writings of her equally celebrated peers. Like Nelson Mandela, who immersed himself in the works of leaders who had overseen difficult transitions such as Jan Smarts, Jawaharlal Nehru, Karl van Kloswitz, Kwame Nkrumah, Dennis Reid, and Chief Albert Lutuli, just to name a few. Nadine, who called herself an autodidact, not only studied and turned up on literature from the classics to the modern, but empowered herself to straddle a number of creative areas. Giving a talk at the community church in New York in 1963 about what it means to be an artist and the writer's struggle for integrity. James Baldwin said that poets by which he meant all artists, quote, are finally the only people who know the truth about us. Soldiers don't, statesmen don't, priests don't, union leaders don't, only poets, unquote. He expounds on the durability of the poetic mission reminding us that our knowledge of the Oedipus complex comes not because of Freud, but because of a poet, Sophocles, who lived in Greece thousands of years ago. He says there is something awful about a civilization that ceases to produce poets. And even more crucially, a civilization that ceases to believe in the report that only the poets can make. When I started this talk, I spoke of the writer as a witness and a truth teller. That was Nadine Godima, a quintessential South African who, because of her love for her country, could write about it without, with devastating clarity and humility. She used words creating that vocabulary for witnesses, that poetry, which gave a report about the situation at home. If she were to rise today, she would wonder at the incoherence of the message that she had fought for so relentlessly to put through, that all people met. She was amazed that the film Cry Freedom was shot entirely in Zimbabwe, which stood for South Africa. Even those scenes of the slaughter of school children in Soweto in June 1976 were shot in Zimbabwe with Zimbabwean extras. Today, she would shudder at the language of the xenophobes, some of them occupying the seats of the mighty, who fulminate in their call for the expulsion of all people, the darker races who come from the other side of the border. As a white South African, the irony of black Af South Africans slaughtering their brethren would not be lost on her, nor would she be surprised at the obscenity of the opting out of the out of the troubled experiment called the New South Africa.
by white society. All this would bring back memories of all the people that had inspired all those books. Bram Fischer, fictionalized in Beggar's Daughter, revolutionaries in July's people, all those thousands of lives cut down in the making of a dream. The least she would have hoped for would be that her creative strivings had grown the seeds that would germinate into the fruits of creative freedom. Lastly, back to the poem by Margaret Walker. Let a new earth arise. Let another world be born. Let a bloody peace be written in the sky. Let a second generation full of courage issue forth. Let a people loving freedom come to growth. Let a beauty full of healing and a strength of final cleansing be depositing in our spirits and our bloods. Let the martial songs be written. Let the dirges disappear. Let a new race of men and women now rise and take control. Thank you very much.